Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Vild. The creators of the of the hit point card game ro card game role playing game hybrid. The one the one and only Jay Coughlin, also known as just Jay. How you doing today, man? Good, good. Appreciate you uh, inviting me onto the stream. I'm excited to be here. I appreciate you coming on. So, I'd like to open with the humble beginnings, as I often do in the temple. So walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. So I've been playing role-playing games for probably around 15 or so years at this point. I've been playing trading card games for, for much, much longer, actually. Um, my days started at early, early years of Yu-Gi-Oh! And I grew up playing Yu-Gi-Oh! Then transitioned to Magic dabbled in some Pokemon and a lot of other indie uh, card games. Uh, for role-playing, I've mostly played 5e. Um, I dabbled in Numenera. Uh, what is it? Stars Without Number, I think is the name of it. And a few other indie RPGs, but nothing lengthy. 5e was definitely just like my main uh, RPG system. So I was a player at the beginning that I feel like most people start as. Um, I was a player for a few years and nervous to take the reins as a game master up until probably about three to five years into my RPGing career. I finally had the guts to, to take on those reins and I've kind of become a forever DM from it. <laughs> so... One of these days, I'm gonna have to write out. I'm gonna have to write out that sketch I had in the back of my mind of doing a, um, a forever a forever DMs anonymous, um, thing. That, <laughs> there's been two. There's been two get. There's been two sketches that I've had in the back of my mind as far as doing. One of them is that. The other one is, so some sort of parody of the of those sad of those sad ads we all saw, like the that the ASPCA and other companies would do would do. Oh yeah. Um. This time, this time about adopting a D twelve. <laughs> <laughs> That's hilarious with the sad music and everything laid over. Yeah, and if anybody gets mad at me, I just say it's a. I just say it's a parody. It's a parody, motherfuckers. <laughs> <laughs> I think you should do it. Yeah, I mean, I I want to. It's just a matter of figuring out the angle and getting my inner muse to, pl um, play nice with me. Right. Right. But with the, but with that said, since you you mentioned you, you mentioned Yu-Gi-Oh and I'm I'm guessing that you get, I'm guessing that you got your start with the very er, the very early end of the end of the spectrum. Um was there were was it mainly was it mainly that or were there a few other um card games that you had messed around with back in the day it was pretty much only Yu-Gi-Oh um I I got like uh what is it the Duel Masters and the card fight Vanguard I had decks for those but I never really played them more than maybe five times um and I always collected Pokemon cards but I never actually played until later in, in my life, uh, for whatever reason, I'm not really sure. I just never did. Mm -hmm. I started Yu-Gi-Oh! probably around... Shoot, when did I start? I think the, the earliest memory I have is, is the obnoxious Celtic Guardian tins and the uh, whatever tin series that was. I forget what other what other cards were in it. And I played all the way up until kind of the end of the Ixies, kind of when they were introducing the pendulum mm. mechanic. And that's when I 
stepped away. I've got I've gone on record as being very critical of the um pe of the pendulum mechanic. Yeah, I just didn't get it and I didn't want to stick around to to get it. Yeah. You know, I was just kind of over it at that point the game became so much of just if you don't have this archetype of a deck then you, you don't even stand a chance. There's I remember when I I remember when I've talked about Shadowrun on this um, series, and I've talked about how, um, a false choice thing, because and the and where this comes into something like Yu-Gi-Oh is the idea of oh you can you can build any kind of you can build any kind of deck, but as time went on, there seems to be more and more in this focus on deck archetypes, mm -hmm. which in all but name and all but saying it are classes, right. Right, exactly. And if you want, if you want to build that, if you want to have decks that are built on classes like that, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, Hearthstone did that and it worked. But don't, tr but don't try and play half seas. Is what I'm saying. Yeah. Well, um, it, the whole thing was like the having that meta was fine, except it got to the point where you know a little casual kid like me wanted to go to. Uh, just the local game store and play and just totally got smoked my first game. And maybe that's just because I was never a really competitive player, but well I've all I've whenever it whenever it comes to that kind of thing, I've always seen that as a, as a self inflicted wound. Um in the same vein I, rem I remember when there was all this discussion about um games like Overwatch and Le and League having toxicity problems and I'm like Motherfucker, you did that to yourselves when you for, when you force everybody onto competitive playlists. Mm. Or the in the case of in the case of like a MOBA or even a hero shooter, the answer to the answer to toxicity is very simple. Make bot matches <laughs> or make or make some sort of um some sort of server browser or something like that, something where you where you're not just linking up with randos all the time. Right. And you know this. I I'd say this is the reason why um, the why you don't have this problem with say fighting games because labbing is a thing. Labbing, if you're not familiar, is spending a lot of time in like training modes and the like. Right. Okay. Oh. Yeah, playing computers. Either playing computers or playing or playing a training dummy. Basically, there's some sort of um, casual option. And I remember when I was playing Matt when I was playing Magic back in high school. The thing that I would, I would gravitate to more often was draft play, because nobody knew what they were getting. <laughs> right. Yeah. It kind of levels the playing field for, rather than having. You've got you've got five, and I think that's also the reason why deck building games became more popular. Um, because because of the fact that with a deck building game, every everybody has the same set of cards. It's more it's more about what you can grab out of the common pool and how you use them. Right, as opposed as opposed to somebody having a, and don't get me wrong, there is a certain appeal in bu in building a particular deck around your style, but the thing is, is as more cards come in, the um, skill floor is gonna is going to rise more and more. Right. Yeah. Agreed. And ideally, you should have a pet. You should instead of assuming people are are um, max level experts right out of the gate. You should in it in, in ideally you should be building around care around characters being around not characters but players um having that pipeline. You now much in the same way that somebody starts out in in little leagues, then goes to the minor leagues, then goes to the majors. I'm vastly simplifying, but you get the idea. Right. Yeah. Exactly. I get, I get mm -hmm. picking up what you're putting down. <laughs> yeah. Now. With hit point, you're describing that as a standalone TCG, or a t that can also be played as a TTRPG adventure. And because of because of that, there's a few there's a few games that instantly came to mind that I'm curious if you were familiar with them, if they had been brought up to you in the past, or something like that. The big one is Warlord, which was dubbed as the game you already know how to play. Okay, yeah, no, Warlord I'm not familiar with. 
that was an attempt by Alderac back in the 2000s to do a card game that used a lot of terminology from D&D 3rd Edition. Okay. Hence the, hence the name, the game you already know how to play. Yeah. But is is it a, is it a case where it is where what you're doing with hit point is a card is a card game that has a solo option or how how do you balance the the needs of a card game with a TTRPG? So the way hit point works is you create your character. Um, you know we have playable classes and species that have different strengths and weaknesses, and based on that you build your deck and your deck is your health. So as you take damage or cast cards, you will mill from the top of your deck, and that's showing your character's ex exhaustion uh, as the combat goes on. And so you could build your deck using, you know, cards from, from the sets that we put out. Um, and right now we have four classes, and a lot of those cards reflect from those four classes, have different strengths. Um, whether it comes to inflicting damage over time or uh, just powerful attacks that cost less or uh, healing and buffing and debuffing cards, etc. So using those decks, the combat feels very much almost like JRPG-ish where um, you kind of have your turn, you have your set to choose from what's in your hand, you play it out, people can react to it but then once once that interaction's over turn passes and so it's a very like quick and we tried to make it very simple um for people to grasp mm -hmm. and so the rpg is it's like a d20 it's a d20 mechanic system so if you're doing doing any non-combat encounters you would roll your d20 we have four stats strength precision knowledge and charm that you would add based on what you're good at, you know, what you what you create your character to be. And once you go into combat, that's when you shuffle up your deck that's in front of you and now you have now you have your battle ready. You have your weapons and your armor out, you have all your attacks and your support cards uh, that you've put together, so you've created this character um, and the game really progresses like that and it shines with the use of the deck. And mm -hmm. so if for those who don't play RPGs, you know, you could take that combat aspect out of the role playing component and just play combat with other people. And that's kind of where the TCG comes in. Mm -hmm. uh, card decks are set at 60 cards, so everyone has an equal amount of life and combat f functions the exact same way. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Now, with that with that in mind, since you're picking since you're doing character creation, you're doing the race class combinations. Are you doing leveling when it comes yeah. to the, when it comes to this approach? How so? Is it a case where you're starting at level zero and as things progress, you're leveling up in a game, or is it a set level once you start? So we're doing we're starting at level zero. So like people are classless once they create a level zero character. Um, and then once they hit that first level, they can go into whatever class they choose. We have four. A Brutalist, which is like a warrior. A Brigand is your assassin. A Sayer is like a Druid Shaman. And the Luthier is the Bard. And so those are the four classes we have right now. And the way the leveling works is we have skill trees. And based on your level, you can climb your tree, which usually gives you um, perks for what are your class-related cards. Uh, so, for example, if you were to level up in the Sayer class, which is the Druid Shaman, you can cast your totems or spirits for free, or you get them at a discounted rate. You can play them at a quicker speed, or they last longer, things of that nature. Um, and then you can end up multi-classing into other classes if you wanted to, and that will give you bonuses, you know, based on the tree, how, how much you'd climb in each tree. Mm-hmm. That ma that makes sense. So with with that in, with that in mind, uh, you admit in some in some role playing games you have that you've had this issue where martial characters have a bit less to do, you know, just ba just basic attack all day every day, and that 
which some some people will say, well, that's fine. They have basic attack at a higher bonus. It's still basic attack. Lipstick right. on a pig. But because of the 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 way you have it as it as card based, I'm I'm assuming that equipment, actions, all all of that is handled through cards. Correct. Yeah. So like a lot of the the brutalist again, which is our warrior, a lot of their strength lies in more damage at a lesser cost. We inflicting a bleed condition, which is like a damage over time. Um, but also their weapons and armor are a lot stronger than, you know, your your assassin or your your sayer. And um, the equipment on it itself also has bonuses. So one of the the brutalist chess pieces, I believe, like you can pay whatever the cost is, and it gives you resistances to physical damage. So you get those very warrior esque effects from those kinds of cards. Mm -hmm. So with that with that in mind, some games rely on certain resources, whether it be energy, whether it be mana, and, and the like. Some have resources doubling as the permanent cards that you're putting on the, for lack of a better term, field. Where does hit point fall into that dichotomy in terms of resource management? So your resource is your health, which is your deck. Mm -hmm. So you have to really manage the cards you're using versus the damage you're taking, because obviously the more you take damage, the less resources you have to use. And I don't mean just by having enough to pay for the cards in your hand, but also the cards that you draw, um, you'll have less of an option if they end up going into your exhaust zone. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it's... It's a very simple mechanic in terms of you don't have to wait for mana or you don't have to, um, you know, wait for this external energy source. But it is very uh, resource. It's a lot of resource management to to really calculate if you should block, take the damage, cast this card, etc. cetera, um, which I think really helps speed up the game and it really simplifies the game, but it also keeps it really engaging mm -hmm. and i'm um, given that now given that is it a case where de where um damage is also is also treated as you discarding cards from the deck correct yeah so if you were to take two damage that you don't block or react to you would just mill two cards mm -hmm. and then you could get them back by healing mm -hmm. but there's no guarantee that you'll have healing available to you. Yeah. So there's always that risk. Yeah. I remember I remember looking through the document you had sent and there were bonuses that were applied based on based on race. Is there going to be a a um, particular spot where that's going to be tracked or is there going to be like a a card that you'd have off to the side to remind you of what those bonuses are? So right now we're we're utilizing a character sheet, and it's basically a simple one pager that has your characters. And so like this kind of ties into the RPG. You don't really get bonuses from your species in the TCG, mm -hmm. um, but you'd have your character sheet that has your character name, your details, you know, height, weight, eye color, etc. You have your four stats, mm -hmm. and you basically have an inventory box. And so that's kind of where you can keep track of any external bonuses you get, any loot items that you find on your adventures uh, that you can use that aren't in your deck. Mm -hmm. um, just a simple way for people to track it outside. Yeah. And it also looked like you are doing a skill tree as far as advancement, which does bring the question how you're handling advancement. Yeah, so currently player growth and player advancement is handled by like a milestone evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, the game master will determine whether or when the party levels up. Uh, we'll, we'll have adventures that we're working on that will guide game masters to that as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's pretty much a, okay... This, at this time, you guys level up, so now you can go one step further into your tree. Yeah. 
or pick a different tree or you know whatever you decide yeah and it it also it also looked like you have um a few a few side paths like for example with the brutalist there was the earthshaker side path and the guardian sh side path i'm i'm guessing that with each of the each of the classes that you have designed it's going to be on that sort of principle there's the baseline but there's also um side pa side paths if somebody wants to double down in one particular aspect correct yeah so you'll have your base class and then they kind of have specializations that they can choose from so the the brutalist has the earth shaker which is your more of the best defense is a good offense mm -hmm. type of class and the guardian would be all right i'm using shields to protect me and my allies good luck getting through you know those kinds of uh specializations and each class right now will have two mm -hmm. and given that now given that um I also saw the notion of growth seeds to represent a to represent a character health as in terms of tiers is growth seeds the equivalent of experience it was um and growth seeds is something that we're probably going to end up taking out and just simply call it levels just because we we're trying to we we're trying to be creative and put it towards you know your clash tree growth seed is synonymous but uh, in the end of the day, I think it's just more confusing. Mm -hmm. People are familiar with the 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 mechanic of leveling, so I think that's what we're gonna end up sticking with. Yeah. Now, if you if if say you end up um, running out of cards in your de in your deck after damage and exhaustion, is that just take that just taking you out, or would cert would certain cards be able to be reshuffled back into the deck? So when you run out of cards in your deck, you still utilize what's in your hand. Mm -hmm. That is still your health pool. Uh, but once you run out of those, then then that's it. You're considered reduced to zero HP and essentially dead. Yeah, dead KO. I know some people want. I know some people want to go with the whole zero HP means means dead. No second chances. No death. No death saves. Um. I don't think I don't think that should be applied universally, but that's another st another story. Now, when it comes to attacks, I did see the dot the um die approach. So is it a ca is it a case like for instance the shank card? The power listed on that is two d six. So you'd be rolling two d six to determine how much how many cards you're taking out of somebody's deck, minus correct what, minus whatever they have for um armor. Right, so the way it would work is instead of, like, I know most card games have a set damage, you know, this card does six damage, or whatever. The way we wanted to incorporate it was with a set of polyhedral dice. So you play a card, like Shank, and you would pay the costs, roll the die, and you could either roll really high or roll really low. Add your bonuses, and then your opponent would have to either block that with armor, react to it, or just take the damage. And then at that point, they would exhaust the cards from the top of their deck. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes to your hand, is it a case where you're only drawing one each turn, or you're drawing until you have five? You're only drawing one each turn. Right. Some cards allow you to draw additional cards, um, and if you don't use, if you don't do anything during your turn, you can draw at the end. Mm-hmm. So you could get that extra card if you if you don't want to play anything. Yeah. Now, with that in with that in mind, I'm guessing when it comes to the R the RPG end of things, is it more or less played like a standard um, TTRPG module, or are there some aspects that are unique to Hit Point to consider when it comes to that particular format? Uh, what do you mean by that? Um, if the how um how say encounters are handled for instance would it be handled the same way a standard match would be handled or is there a different is there a different approach that's one question that can be considered how is is the role of the gm um portrayed in that art in that ttrpg mode those kind of things right so the way that we have encounters kind of set up is the combat is exactly the same for both formats 
uh, but the GM has two options. We have pre-written stat blocks uh, for for our enemies that they can utilize, or they can use cards to create their own enemy decks. Mm-hmm. And now that puts basically the GM against the entire rest of the party, which is a really cool dynamic, especially if you're doing like big boss battles. You could create this like huge deck, and now you're having like this ultimate battle uh, via cards, which I, I think is just a, such a cool idea. Um, but if if the game masters don't want to do that, or they need encounters quick that they could pull from their sleeve, mm-hmm. we do have stat blocks that can be used uh, pretty seamlessly uh, in combat. And I also noticed that the within that stat block you have at least with the example with the shrimp, you have what you call a sentience table, which I'm guessing is meant to be kind of a soft AI for oh, monster behavior. Pretty much. Yeah, so we we had this idea for uh, put including a sentience table in our stat block, so that way if a game master wanted to have their own character, they could create their own deck and their own character and play alongside the story. They would have to drive the story, of course, uh, but whenever an encounter comes, they can they can utilize that. So that way they can, like you said, have like this AI type of creature battling. Which, in theory, would that make it so that... Would that mean that someone could play hit points, some TTRPG variant, GM-less? Yes, but they would still need somehow to draw, drive the story. Mm-hmm. That I have, we have not thought of a way to do that yet. So I would say, at this point, no, it's not GMless. The combat, yes, but not the not the RPG as a whole. All right, that that certainly makes sense. Now, sometimes there will be special rules applied to magic use in in some of these affairs. Is that a is that a case here, or is that or is it a case where? Um, that were that is not that is not applicable no i players can use magic as long as they have it in their deck and they so, have the cards to to call, pay the cost to play it so would magic just be treated as a different type of action or or i, sh- I should say a spell would just be an a- would just be an action card correct yeah i mean there are Actions and free actions, which means, you know, actions are cost you your action can only be played on your turn, and a free action can only be played on your turn, but it doesn't utilize your action, mm-hmm. so you could still play something else. Now uh, cards are also reactions, yeah. so you can react to someone else's action, and spells are all of the above. Mm-hmm. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the reactions. Is it a case where you can only use one reaction out, outside outside of your turn, or is it a case where you can use as many as um, are tr- are triggerable that you want to use? You just have to pay the cost for each one. No, so you can only get you only have one reaction as a base, and then you could have cards that modify that. Mm-hmm. There are there's a totem that the sayers use that give them an extra action and reaction per rotation mm-hmm. per round. Um, so at that point, they could use two. But innately, players only get one. Right, that that certainly makes sense. Um, I'd be remiss if I didn't point out that there's there is one, um, there's one MMO that was very that cite that supposedly cited Magic the Gathering as an influence in terms of that mixing between deck building and role and role playing, and that was the original Guild Wars, and I'm. Curious if that was ever a minor influence on how you develop things. I would say the the influence that there was a few things that influenced us as we were creating this, um, and it was definitely Dungeons and Dragons mixed with uh, World of Warcraft, and mm-hmm. I would say Yu Gi Oh and Flesh and Blood were like the four I think core. Um, influences I could I could certainly see it um, especially with especially with how 
Um, World of Warcraft did have its did have its own card game by Upper, by Upper Deck at one point. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was wasn't aware of that. It was it was all right, but I think it was trying to do too much at once. Mm. Because you had the PvP part, you also had you also had a quest system within it. You had the notion of um of do of doing heroes and do and doing classes and do and doing equipment. Like I think I think in in my personal opinion, Warcraft would have been a better um point of reference to build that sort of card game around instead of World of Warcraft. Because yeah. doing that yeah, sort of I customization mean... for heroes, um, it's it can it can get it can get a bit overwrought when you have multiple heroes that you're dealing with. Right. Yeah, we less wanted to focus on having existing heroes, more so as you creating and being your own hero. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense, like you're playing. Your character, yeah, and I, I like in I like in what I saw with the World of Warcraft card game to be a product of its time. You know, because you had because a lot of because for a lot of um, designers, the main thing that they knew was the was the model that was pi that was pioneered with Magic: The Gathering. Right. Nothing really wrong with that. But you, but it's a, it is very much a case of the, of um trying to of trying to fit a round peg into a square hole. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Of course. And because and because of that, the the result that you saw was what was the result you're gonna get what you're gonna get. And <laughs> I think nowadays people have realized that there's alternate approaches that can be done. Yeah, definitely, and you know it's it's also a lot about iteration. Mm -hmm. The amount of iterations that we've gone through, just putting something in place and trying it out, and a lot of the times it's it's that simple. You'll immediately say, "This does not work," or you can say, "Wow, this works better than I could have thought." Mm -hmm. And. Of course, of course, there's ups and downs with that, as there is with anything. People, it's a lot of failing until you get it right. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. A lot of uh, back to the drawing board and thinking of other solutions, and but that part is fun, you know. Like coming up with, trying to think of mechanics to, trying to think of loopholes that will break current mechanics, and then thinking of mechanics to fix those loopholes, and it's like a fun problem solving challenge mm -hmm. even if even if that fun involves banging your head against the wall several times yeah I mean it's all part of the process <laughs> yeah now with with that said as I as I understand it you are do, you're gonna be doing um so you're going to be doing several main main decks and and boosters. Would it be fair of me to say that that the sets that you're building around are built in the style of modules? Like I think I think one of them that was right at the top was the was corruption of house fear. Correct. Yeah. So uh, corruption of house fear is our first set, and it takes place in house fear, mm -hmm. and this is a forever autumn forest continent uh, that's part of our world map of basil Don. and you know it's a normally very peaceful place it's the home to all of the sayers which again are the druid shamans and there's been a terrible corruption that's turning everything feral and violent and so as part of the adventure that we're working on you're you're going to be going through exploring the continent and trying to solve where the corruption is coming from and stopping it. Mm -hmm. I can I can certainly get that, and it does it does seem that 
un unlike some that are using kind of a kitchen sink approach, you do have a set setting in mind for hit point. Correct. Yes. Yeah. I mean, we have this entire world kind of built out and I mean, we're still building it out, but mm -hmm. this one set, this continent is such a small piece in the entire puzzle. You know, there's just so much that we can pull from still. And that's, it's just so exciting to have that kind of potential to branch into. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, given that, do you do you plan on in the rule book and and some other materials? Do you plan on putting in um, lore materials for the for that setting? Yes, yeah. So in in the rule book, which is not in there right now, we're going to add in um, a demo adventure. So I think it's going to be like a single adventure mm -hmm. uh, kind of playthrough that's a prequel to the set and will include the lore and the background to the species, the classes, the continent, everything uh, within that, just so that way people, you know, they can, can read the background, they can understand what's been happening and, and where, where their actions are taking place. Mm -hmm. I, I can get that. So with, with that said, um, what would you, what would you, what would you see as a as a possible release window for the project? And I do want to congratulate you guys on get on getting um at the time we're recording this forty five hundred total when your goal was um three thousand. Thank you. Yeah, I was we funded in under twenty four hours, which is such a huge accomplishment. Uh, especially this is only our second Kickstarter that we've that we've ran. Mm -hmm. Um, so super excited to to continue on with with everything and to fulfill these pledges and and all of that but our window for fulfillment we're expecting later this year probably around late fall mm -hmm. yeah i can there's a there's a certain irony in house sphere being a being a force that's eternally in autumn and you're releasing this in autumn. <laughs> right i know definitely uh, uh kind of falls into place it's a case where if i didn't know any better i'd have assumed that you were doing that on purpose <laughs> it no actually it just kind of fell that way which uh coincidentally is pretty cool in my opinion mm -hmm. i can i can certainly get that and i and i will look forward to seeing how it develops but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Oh, and... thanks for having me. It was a blast. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often of say course. around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. I love it. I could use me a good drink. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>